रद्द मारितो राज्य दा मानत मान्यती अन्न तेज दुकान लो वापस पड़े दो केंद्र डेल्टा प्रदेश वन्ना की मार्ग लगे तो मुंचे अली राज्य दा मान्यती दंता संदर्भ दली लड़ा को जम्मू कश्मीर ये वैल्लवो कुडा सेरी अली चुनाव ने निर्दिता है तो यावगे त्रि सेवेंटी रद्दती आई तला आ त्रि सेवेंटी रद्दती आदन नंतरा आ विधियन्ना रद्दु मारी दा बलिका लड़ाकन वंदने केंद्र डेल्टा प्रदेश वन्ना की मार्ग लाई तो तदन नंतरा जम्मू मत्तु कश्मीर वन्ना केंद्र डेल्टा प्रदेश वन्ना की मार्ग लागेर वन्तु दो ये वंदो विभजने कुड़ा ओके इध मारित सरी इधे ऐंता अबे ले केंद्र सरकार द परवागी वाद वने मारु वंता संधर्भ दल लुकड़ा आज्ता इन्हों यश्तोष चाहगे ते इगा राज्य द मान्य ते सेगो दादरे इन केल दागा शांति सुव्यवस्था यल्लवु कुड़ा मत्ते मरुकली सिदा बलिका यल्लवु सरी आदा बलिका अधके मत्तो में राज्य द स्थान मानवने न्याय वादी गुरु अदना वादा मंडी सिद्ध ये लल्लव नुकुरा सुधीर गवागी आलिसितु सुप्रीम कोर्ट सांविधानिका पीठा हदीना रु दिना निर्दितु इधर दा उन्हें वादा प्रतिवादा निरंतर वागी वादा प्रतिवादा आधा बलिका सर्व सम्मत दत तीर्पु बंदी दा for the purpose of day-to-day -day administration, every decision and action taken by the union executive on behalf of the state is not subject to challenge. Opening up challenge to every decision would lead to chaos and uncertainty. It would in effect put the administration in the state at a standstill. Therefore, the following standard is laid down to assess actions under Article 356 after the proclamation has been issued. A. The exercise of power by the President under Article 356 must have a reasonable nexus to the object of the proclamation. B. The person ex challenging the exercise of power must prima facie establish that it is a malafide or extraneous exercise of power. After the prima facie case is made, the owner shifts to the union to justify that the exercise of power had a reasonable nexus with the object of the proclamation. And C. The exercise of power by the President for everyday administration of the state is not ordinarily subject to judicial review. The argument of the petitioners that the Union government cannot take actions which have irreversible consequences when a proclamation under Article 356 is in force is not accepted. The power of the legislature of the state under Article 357 to repeal or alter or amend a law enacted by Parliament in exercise of the power of the legislature of the state must be read in the context of the amendment introduced by the Constitution 42nd Amendment Act 1976. Before the amendment, the law to the extent of incompetency would automatically cease to exist after a buffer period and actions done were expressly saved. However, an express repeal by the competent legislature is required for the law to cease to exist after the amendment. The repealing statute would in such case make provisions for actions taken during the subsistence of the legislation. The observations in Krishna Kumar Singh on whether the consequence of an ordinance can subsist even after the ordinance ceases to exist cannot be transposed to interpret the limits of Article 356 because an ordinance which has the effect of a law by its very nature has a limited life. The argument of the petitioners that Parliament can only assume the, assume the law-making powers of the legislature of the state when the proclamation under Article 356 is issued is not accepted. The purpose of Article 357 is to ensure that while exercising the powers of the legislature of the state, pursuant to a declaration under Article 356.1, Parliament, or as the case may be, the President, are not impeded by an absence of competence which would have impeded the exercise of a similar power in the absence of a proclamation under Article 356. Further, Article 357 does not contain a non obstante provision which overrides Article 356. To interpret Article 357.1 as a restriction on Article 356.1b would be to read in a restriction which the plain terms of the Constitution do not provide. As held above, 
the exercise of power after a proclamation under Article 356 is issued is subject to judicial review and immunity from judicial scrutiny does not attach to the exercise of constitutional powers of the legislature of the state. The court, while judicially reviewing the exercise of power, can determine if the exercise of the constitutional power of the legislature of the state by parliament has a reasonable nexus with the object sought to be achieved by the proclamation. The next issue is whether Jammu and Kashmir retained an element of sovereignty or internal sovereignty when it joined the Union of India. We have held that the state of Jammu and Kashmir did not retain an element of sovereignty when it joined the Union of India. We have arrived at this conclusion for the following reasons. First, paragraph 8 of the instrument of accession executed by Maharaja Hari Singh provided that nothing in the instrument would affect the continuance of the sovereignty of the Maharaja in and over the state. Second, on 25 November 1949, a proclamation was issued for the state of Jammu and Kashmir by Yuvraj Karan Singh. The declaration in this proclamation that the constitution of India would not only supersede all other constitutional provisions in the state, which were inconsistent with it, but also abrogate them, achieves what would have been attained by an agreement of merger. With the issuance of the proclamation, paragraph 8 of the instrument of accession ceased to be of legal consequence. The proclamation reflects the full and final surrender of sovereignty by Jammu and Kashmir through its sovereign ruler to India, to her people who are sovereign. Third, neither the constitutional setup nor any other factors indicate that the state of Jammu and Kashmir retained an element of sovereignty. The constitution of Jammu and Kashmir was only to further define the relationship between the Union of India and the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The relationship was already defined by the instrument of accession, the proclamation by Yuvraj Karan Singh in November 1949, and more importantly, by the Constitution of India. Fourth, there is a clear absence in the Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir of a reference to sovereignty. In contrast, the Constitution of India emphasizes in its preamble that the people of India resolve to constitute themselves or to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. Fifth, that the state of Jammu and Kashmir became, became an integral part of the Union of India is evident from Articles 1 and 370 of the Indian Constitution. It is reiterated, it is reiterated in Section 3 of the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, which is unamendable. Sixth, the preamble of the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, sections 3, 5 and 147 of the state constitution, coupled with Article 1 of the constitution of India, read with the first schedule, as well as Article 370, indicate in no uncertain terms that a system of subordination, as, unstitute, as understood by the definition of sovereignty, exists by which the state is subordinate to the Indian constitution first and only then to its own constitution. Seventh, all states in the country have legislative and executive power, albeit to differing degrees. The constitution accommodates concerns specific to a particular state by providing for arrangements which are specific to that state. Articles 371A to 371J are examples of special arrangements for different states. This is a feature of asymmetric federalism, like Article 370, which became applicable to Jammu and Kashmir on the adoption of the constitution. The state of Jammu and Kashmir does not have internal sovereignty which is distinguishable from the powers and privileges enjoyed by other states in the country. And eighth, the limited question before the constitution bench in its decision in Premnath Call was whether the monarch held plenary legislative powers after the constitution of India as it applied to Jammu and Kashmir was adopted in the state, but before the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir was adopted. A decision is an authority for the proposition which it decides. The question whether the state of Jammu and Kashmir retained sovereignty upon integration with the dominion of India did not arise in that case. The next issue which we have addressed is the challenge to Constitutional Order 273, CO 273. To answer this issue, we had to decide on two issues. One, 
whether Article 370 is a temporary provision, and two, the effect of the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir on the scope of powers under Clause 3 of Article 370. We have held that Article 370 is a temporary provision on a reading of the historical context in which it was included. Article 370 was introduced to serve two purposes. First, the transitional purpose to provide for an interim arrangement until the Constituent Assembly of the state was formed and could take a decision on the legislative competence of the Union on matters other than the ones stipulated in the instrument of accession and ratify the Constitution. And second, a temporary purpose, an interim arrangement in view of the special circumstances because of the war conditions in the state. C. We have held that a textual reading of Article 370 also indicates that it is a temporary provision. For this purpose, we have referred to the placement of the provision in Part 21 of the Constitution, which deals with temporary and transitional provisions. The marginal note to the provision, which states temporary provisions in respect to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, and a reading of Articles 370 and 1, by which the state became an integral part of India, upon the adoption of the Constitution. D. On the second question of the effect of the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir on the scope of powers under Clause 3 of Article 370, we have held that the power of the President of India under Article 370 Clause 3 to issue a notification declaring that Article 370 ceases to exist, ceases to exist, subsists even after the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir for the following reasons. First, the proviso to Article 373, that is Clause 3, encapsulates the process by which the Indian states could ratify the Constitution of India. The ruler of each Indian state had to issue a proclamation ratifying the Constitution on the recommendation of the Constituent Assembly where such body existed. In states where the Constituent Assembly was not convened by then, the ruler of the state had to issue a proclamation accepting the Constitution. When a Constituent Assembly was convened in those states, the Constituent Assembly could make a recommendation for the modification of the Constitution as it applied to the state, and such a recommendation would be earnestly considered, into inverted commas, earnestly considered by the Union. The words recommendation of the Constituent Assembly referred to in Clause 2 shall be necessary before the President issues a notification as it appears in the proviso to Article 370, Clause 3 and must be read in this context. Thus, the recommendation of the Constituent Assembly to begin with was not binding on the President. Second, at the time of the framing of the Constitution of India, it was obviously within the contemplation that the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir was formed for framing the Constitution for the state. It was not intended to be a permanent body, but a body with a specific remit and purpose. The power conferred by the proviso to Article 370, Clause 3, was hence something which would operate in a period of transition when the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir was formed and was in existence pending the drafting of the state constitution. Third, when the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir ceased to exist, only one of the special circumstances for which the provision was introduced ceased. However, the other circumstances, that is the special circumstances because of the situation in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, for which Article 370 was introduced, subsisted even after, after the Constituent Assembly ceased to exist. This is recognized by the judgment of the Constitution Bench in Sampad Prakash. Fourth, the effect of the President declaring under Clause 3 of Article 370 that Article 370 ceases to exist, is that the provisions of the Constitution which apply to every state in the first schedule would equally apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Articles 371D and 370 bracket 3 were introduced with the purpose of enhancing constitutional integration and not for the disintegration. So, the power under Article 371D and Article 370 Clause 3 even when exercised to its fullest extent, does not freeze the system of integration contemplated by Article 370, but is rather intended to enhance constitutional integration 
between the Union and the state of Jammu and Kashmir, holding that the power under Article 370, Clause 3 cannot be exercised after the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly would lead to the freezing of the process of integration contrary to the purpose of introducing the provision. And five, if the contention of the petitioners on the interpretation of Article 370 vis-a-vis -vis the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly is accepted, then Article 370, Clause 3 would become redundant and would lose its temporary character. The President, while deciding if the power under Article 370, Clause 3 must be exercised, determines if the special circumstances which warranted a special solution in the form of Article 370 have ceased to exist. This is a policy decision which completely falls within the realm of the executive. The court cannot sit and appeal over the decision of the President of India on whether the special circumstances which led to the arrangement under Article 370 have ceased to exist. However, the decision is not beyond the scope of re judicial review. It is settled law that the exercise of executive power can be challenged on the ground of malafides. The slew of constitutional orders issued by the President under Article 371D, applying various provisions of the Constitution and applying provisions with modification, indicate that over the course of the last 70 years, the Union and the State have, through a collaborative exercise, constitutionally integrated the State of Jammu and Kashmir with the Union. This is not a case where only Articles 1 and Article 370 of the Constitution were applied to the state of Jammu and Kashmir and suddenly, after 70 years, the entire Constitution was being made applicable. The continuous exercise of power under Article 370, Clause 1 by the President indicates that the gradual process of constitutional integration was ongoing. The declaration issued by the President in exercise of the power under Clause 3 of Article 370 is a culmination of the process of integration. Thus, we do not find that the President's exercise of power under Clause 3 of Article 370 was malafide. Having concluded that the power under Article 370 Clause 3 subsisted, even after the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly, we have held that the exercise of power by the President to issue CO 273 is a valid exercise of constitutional power. The next issue is the challenge to CO 272 on the ground that the power under Article 371D cannot be issued to apply all the provisions of the Constitution to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. We have held that all provisions of the Constitution can be applied to Jammu and Kashmir through the exercise of power under Article 371D. The power under Article 371D can be used to apply one provision, more than one provision, an entire part of the Constitution, or all the provisions of the Constitution, that is the entire Constitution. The provision does not make a distinction between one or all provisions of the Constitution. Non-application of mine cannot be claimed merely because CO 272 applies all provisions of the Constitution to Jammu and Kashmir in one go. The next issue is the challenge to CO 272 on the ground that the President could not have secured the concurrence of the Union Government under the second proviso to Article 371D. We hold that the President seeking the concurrence of the Union Government instead of the Government of the State to issue CO 272 is not invalid because, first, the effect of applying all the provisions of the Constitution to the State of Jammu and Kashmir through the exercise of power under Article 371D is the same as an exercise of power under Article 370, Clause 3, notifying that Article 370 shall cease to exist. That is, all provisions of the Constitution of India will apply to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, except for the fact that the former can be reversed while the latter, namely under Clause 3, cannot. Second, consultation and collaboration between both the units will only be necessary where the application of the provisions of the Indian Constitution to the state would require amendments to the state constitution because the purpose of the requirements of consultation and collaboration is for the smooth functioning of governance in the state and to ensure that the provisions of the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir are not inconsistent with the provisions of the constitution of India. Third, since the effect of applying all the provisions of the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, since the effect of applying all the provisions of the constitution to Jammu and Kashmir 
to the exercise of the power under Article 371D is the same as issuing a notification under Article 370 Clause 3, which the President has the power to unilaterally issue the principle of consultation and collaboration and not required to be followed. Fourth, the exercise of power is malafide only if power was exercised with an intent to deceive. Deception can only be proved if the power which is otherwise unavailable to the authority or body is exercised or if the power that is available is improperly exercised. Since the concurrence of the state government was not required for the exercise of power under Article 370, bracket 1, bracket D, to apply all provisions of the Constitution to the state, the President securing the concurrence of the Union of India on behalf of the state government is not malafide. The next issue is the challenge to, Art to CO 272 on the ground that it is ultra vires Article 370, 1D, because it modifies Article 370. We have held that the modification by CO 272 to Article 367 as it applies to Jammu and Kashmir had the effect of amending Article 370 and is thus ultra vires Article 370, bracket 1D. We have reached this conclusion for the following reasons. First, recourse must be had to the procedure contemplated by Article 370, Clause 3. If Article 370 is to cease to operate or is to be amended or modified in its application to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, no other procedure may be utilized to amend Article 370. Second, the rule of interpretation that a power under a statute must be exercised in accordance with the provisions of that statute and in no other manner is undoubtedly applicable to the Constitution. Third, from precedent, including Shankari Prasad Singh, Sajjan Singh, Kihoto Holohan, and Rajendra Shah, it emerges that the following aspects are of significance when assessing whether a change has been made to a provision of the Constitution. One, a change may be either in terms of or in its effect. Two, a change can be said to have been made even if the language of the concerned provision is not directly amended by adding, subtracting, or modifying the language, this is a change in effect. And three, if the effect of an amendment is to change a provision, such effect must be significant or appreciable. And four, the substance of a change is more important than its form. Second, an assessment of whether a constitutional order amounts to a modification and consequently whether the procedure under Article 370, Clause 1 or under Article 370, Clause 3 ought to have been followed depends on this standard. Third, the effect of a provision of law is as important as its form. While the change sought to be made by paragraph 2 of CO 272 may appear to be a modification or amendment of Article 367 at first blush, its effect is to amend Article 370 itself. CO 272 changes the language to the proviso to Article 370 Clause 3 in two ways. First, it changes the recommending body from the Constituent Assembly to the Legislative Assembly. And second, it makes a new arrangement at variance with that specific Constituent Assembly. Both these changes are not insignificant because they modify the essential character of the proviso by substituting a particular type or kind of body with another type or kind entirely. Fourth, while the interpretation clause, namely Article 367, can be used to define or give meaning to particular terms, it cannot be deployed to amend a provision by bypassing the specific procedure laid down for its amendment. This would defeat the purpose of having a procedure for making an amendment to the Constitution of India. Fifth, the consequence of permitting amendments through the circuitous manner would be disastrous. Many provisions of the Constitution would be susceptible to amendments which evade the procedure stipulated by Article 368 or other provisions. Sixth, the previous constitutional orders which modified Article 370 through Article 367 were clarificatory and consequential. They did not have the effect of amending Article 370. We have therefore held as ultra vires the, uh, the, the amendments which were made to Article 370 Clause 3 by taking recourse to Article 367. G. The status of the Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. The gaps left by the non-application of some parts of the Constitution of India were filled by the Constitution of the state. After the, after the abrogation of Article 370, as it stood before the issuance of CO 272 and CO 273, and the application of the entirety of the Constitution of India to the state, 
the constitution of the state does not fulfill any purpose or serve any function. Hence, the implicit but necessary consequence of the application of the constitution of India in its entirety to the state of Jammu and Kashmir is that the constitution of the state is inoperative. On the validity of Parliament's exercise of power under the first proviso to Article 3, this is what we have said. A five-judge bench of this court in Babulal Parate held that the views expressed by the legislature of the state under the proviso to Article 3 are not binding on Parliament. If the views of the state legislature were binding on Parliament, which is not the case, there would be scope for debate on whether Parliament in exercise of its powers under Article 356.1b could have substituted its views for the views of the Legislative Assembly of the state. However, the views of the Legislature of the state are not binding on Parliament in terms of the first proviso to Article 3. The views of the Legislature of the state under the first proviso to Article 3 are recommendatory to begin with. Thus, Parliament's exercise of power under the first proviso to Article 3 is valid and not malafide. The next issue is on the validity of the suspension of the second proviso to Article 3 as applicable to Jammu and Kashmir. When the reorganization bill was introduced, that is on 5 August 2019, the second proviso to Article 3 as it applied to the state of Jammu and Kashmir ceased to exist because of CO 272. Thus, the issue of whether the second proviso to Article 3 could have been suspended in exercise of the power under Article 